So let's go to San Francisco now, and joining me from there is Richard Jaroslavsky. He is the vice president of Smart News and the technology columnist for Observer.com. Welcome once again, Rich. Great to have you as always. Now, it's a fascinating story, but how much of this comes as a surprise to you being so close to Silicon Valley as you are? Very little of it. I mean, we've seen uh, time and time again, particularly with Twitter, that it's not a secure platform for advertisers or for users. So, um, you know, the fact that bots are um, as many as 15% of its user base, uh, that's a huge number, but it's, it's just not a shock. Twitter has shown very little interest in clamping down on, um, on these, uh, these ecosystems. It's kind of the dark underbelly of Twitter. Well, that's the point, though. It is a dark underbelly, something that, that ordinarily you wouldn't really figure on. Um, and more to the point, all of these likes and followers have become a marketable commodity. Um, so as the light gets shone on of all this, is there a likelihood that companies like Facebook and Twitter are going to see some of their, their revenue base being uh, swept out from under them? Well, I suspect this is a bigger issue for Twitter than it is for Facebook, um, although the, the controls on Facebook are not particularly uh, stringent. They are somewhat more rigorous than Twitter. Uh, but part of this issue is, you know, the Twitter itself has a vested interest in, um, in having these, allowing these fake accounts. Because if you're an advertiser and you're coming to purchase placement in Twitter, in people's news feeds for your, um, for your product, um, you know, uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter may be, you have no way of knowing whether Twitter is placing your advertisement uh, in a feed uh, of a bot, uh, a person that doesn't really exist. So Twitter itself is profiting from this as well, which was an element that the Times story really didn't go into, but is, is definitely a contributing factor here. Now, the other interesting part of all this, of course, is the fact that social media have spawned an entirely new industry of so-called influencers. These are uh, people like vloggers who might be on YouTube selling makeup or, or you know, doing cookery shows or whatever. Um, and they're making a living out of all of these sorts of things. Are these revelations going to end up hurting their livelihoods? It should, although I'm not confident that it will. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the number of followers becomes the, the sort of mark of credibility um, for these influencers who can then parlay this into lucrative financial deals with the brands that they're promoting. Um, so it, it only becomes an issue if Twitter actually clamps down on this. Um, and um, and weeds out these bots in a in a more systematic way, then suddenly these people who claim vast influence, uh, you know, it, it will suddenly become clear that the influence that they're claiming, uh, based on the number of followers, uh, is is highly suspect to say the least. Let's talk about regulation because it raises that issue. How can regulators effectively? control this particular issue of social media? It's very hard, given that, um, that all these social network services are multinational. So um, you could have, um, you know, regulation in one market, say the EU, um, and not necessarily have comparable regulation in another market, Asia or the United States. Um, the real, the real um, actor uh, to me at least, uh, and the real responsible party has to be the social network itself. Right. Um, mm. Every one of these social networks has um, right. a short-term vested interest in making it look uh, like they have many more users, uh, but a long-term interest in making sure that they have some credibility in the marketplace. Okay. We are out of time. Rich Jaroslavsky in San Francisco, thank you very much indeed.